gentlemen, it is my uh, great pleasure to do the introduction for this people's lecture. Uh, this lecture series was initiated at the time that Christopher Colby stepped down as Associate Vice President for Research and Academic Computing uh, in 2003. Uh, it was set up and funded and established as a way to uh, honor his legacy of, of being a big thinker and a deep thinker uh, and just a tremendously wonderful guy. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of working for Chris for something on the order of two decades. Uh, he was an anthropologist by training, always asserted that his dissertation work could have, have as easily been information theory as archaeology. Uh, his um, Academic accomplishments were significant and far-reaching uh, from uh, quality and quality methods to information technology to archaeology. He was particularly proud of his facility with a backhoe uh, and never allowed his uh, field assistants to do any of the backhoe work in the Angel Knight Mountains, which is where uh, this field work began. Uh, Chris passed away a few years ago, and we have continued this uh, series in his memory. Uh, and today we have uh, we have a twofer, and our first speaker this morning is Dr. Franco Pastilli, uh, talking about big data neuroscience. And just very very briefly, uh, Franco got his PhD in uh, New York University, great university. Uh, went to uh, Columbia and then the Right Brain Institute. Uh, and Stanford as postdoctoral fellow, research associate, sort of positions, and then came here. Um, and he's just brilliant. Great guy. Um, really, really big thinker. Uh, there are a bunch of people out there thinking about how to map brains and do it, doing it wrong. Uh, Franco has some of the uh, uh, most interesting and innovative uh, approaches to understanding uh, how the human brain works, I think, of anybody around. Uh, you will notice that he uh, he's not a born and bred Hoosier. Uh, he hails from a beautiful country with a with a very very beautiful language, uh, which comes through uh, in a very lovely way in his speaking, which makes it not only uh, uh, instructional and and, and uh, inspirational to listen to, but also very pleasant to listen to. So, with no further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Castelli. I'm grateful for all the work that we have been doing the last year. You, you guys have to know that when I interviewed at IU and I was shopping around for different universities, uh, you guys were one of the things that made me want to come. And I thought, you know, I want to do uh, big data and neuroinformatics. And it's a field coming up in neuroscience. And that university, IU, was the university that was ready. It just felt like it was ready. So, and you see what we achieved in the last year. So, I will introduce a little bit of metaphor at the beginning for the one of you that are non neuroscientists. I will go describing my research and how it fits into the, the uh, idea of computational neuroscience, big data neuroscience, and then I'll show an example of results uh, that we've done with my uh, lab here and uh, also with some of the collaboration that I use. I hope that by the end of this talk, you guys will uh, kind of resist a little bit more you know, the anxiety that sometimes all my requests coming in through all the mailing leads. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> because I know I've been sending many. So this is Moore's Law. Many of you know about this better than me. I should not be talking to you about this, but I need it. Okay, Moore's Law, uh, it's a simple prediction that, you know, computing will increase as the number of transistors on a chip will increase. And, uh, you know, there was a first prediction for one year, I believe. The second revision was two years. And now companies are saying things are slowing down. But in general, Moore's Law tells us something, tell us that, um, uh, that the computing power needs many computers, right? Means many little nodes working together. Uh, one of the recent statements from Intel is that uh, we need to go parallel. This is happening now. Multi-core computers are coming, and and this is what I need to introduce you how the brain works. 
the brain is effectively a, a multi-computer. It's, it's very similar to a high-performance cluster. Okay, and this is important for for us. So recently, today hardware is designed in a multi-core manner, and this is what's keeping Moore's law going up, right? The fact that we're going parallel. The, the human brain has been going parallel for many more years than computers. So this is what I'm saying, right? So I'm saying that the, 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 the computers that we use every day, that I use, that my lab uses, like Big Red 2, uh, it's a good metaphor, a good, good approximation for the way the brain works. So how does, how does this computer work? Well, this computer has many processors, nodes. Each node has cores, you know, 16, 32, right? And they work, they do tasks for us. Now the cores are connected through cables. And you all know the importance of communication through those cables, right? Communication through has to be, the packages has to be sent, has to be precise, had to arrive at the right time. And if you may mess up that communication, it doesn't matter whether you have 16, 64, or 32 cores on each node, it's just not going to work. You're not going to do your computation. Now, this is the human brain. This is what makes you, you, and me, me. So this is a view from the external. This is obviously a post-mortem preparation. And, and what I'm saying here is that the human brain works similarly to a high-performance computer. So I'm going to make a very large zoom out on the brain. Okay. So if you zoom out very far, or probably where you guys are standing, that you, you, you're not neuroscientist, you see two major tissue types in the human brain. You see here a darker pink and a lighter pink. So one simplified way of thinking about it, the compute nodes of the brain are where you see darker darker because the staining that we have been used for this preparation goes into the literally the cell bodies where all the computation arrive and the cell bodies communicate through cables just like a high performance computer the cables are in the white and they're white because they're fat these cables are wrapped into a, a fat called myelin so myelin, actually, it's really important, and it's the, the journey I've talked about to you today. It's all about these cables. Turns out technology has appeared in the last 15, 20 years that allow us to measure these cables in vivo. And that, from that, we've been learning that they matter. Okay? As it matters for you, if you're connecting your CPUs and your hardware using you know, uh, copper or using uh, fiber optic, same for the brain, okay? If those cables are right, the computing is right. So we used to study these cables until recently with post-mortem preparation. This is not very different from what uh, paleontologists do. You know, the way we used to do it, peeling off layers and layers of brain tissue to expose the cables. So here you can see uh, there's major structure, these are structure because they look like highways that go from one part of the brain to another brain. They have names, they are clearly identified over the years by analysts, and we can uh, look at them this way. So recently technology has come, MR technology, that actually allow us to measure very, the very same highways in living brains, and that's important. So here, for example, these are the same highway I just showed you before that communicate motor, that's the orange one, communicate vision, that's the green, yellow one, communicate thinking, that's the blue one, right? So these highways can be measured in living brain. That's my brain, okay? And that might strike a car for you. It's important that we can measure in, vision, in living brains because then we can correlate these, the properties of these cables with individuality and variation with progression of disease or development or the aging process. Turns out, it, they vary a lot. Some people have copper, some people have fiber optic, okay? And more than that, some people go from fiber optic to copper. And we're trying to understand how that's happening, right? I'm obviously simplifying a lot, right? I'm simplifying a lot, it's much more complicated than that. But it, it's, it's not wrong, I mean, this is really what a majority of neuroscientists try to do is trying to use digitized images to understand 
human, uh, uh, the human brain in disease and health. So how does the technology work? Uh, if you zoom in into a very small part of one of these uh, brain uh, highways, then you would see fibrous structures like this one. This is actually from the optic nerve, the nerve that connects the eye to the brain. And you see these little filaments. And these filaments, they are individual nerve cells that are wrapped around by the, the, what, the, the fatty tissue, which is called myelin, that allows communication to be fast and reliable. Okay? Now, water in this tissue actually tends to, water has a normal Brownian motion, right, that we all know about. In this tissue, rather, it's constrained to flow more in one direction than in the other direction. And that is the basic thing, signal that we can measure with the scanner. Okay, we can measure diffusion of water molecule as it is constrained by the shape of this tissue. And by measuring a different location in the brain, we can actually reconstruct the three-dimensional organization of long-range highways of the brain. So once we do that, we actually start seeing it, like large structure like this one in living tissue, in living brain. So these are a few examples. Uh, IFOF connects the back of the brain, visual cortex to the front of the brain, like thinking, rational thinking. And this is another example that connects, again, cognition. The front of the brain is the part of the brain mostly dedicated to cognition and decision making, down into the spinal cord and the thalamus, which is the core relay of the brain. Another one. This is very important for motor and sports. This is connecting motor cortex up here down into the spinal cord. So once we do these measurements, once we identify these three-dimensional structures, we can go back to the measurement of MR and study how the property of the biological tissue change as function of uh, individuals, in, in different individuals, or as function of disease. Here are one example of the sort of measurements we do in the lab. So this is one cortical spinal tract that connects motor cortex to the spinal cord. And I'm showing in the plots measurements in different individuals. Each line is a measurement of the biological properties of that highway, of the tissue, of the myelin tissue in that highway. You see there are differences. For example, one of the individuals here seems to be a little bit off as a lower. Now, the interpretation of the y-axis here, it's complicated. I'm going to leave it there for, for more uh, discussion later. But trust me, it's a measure that correlates with tissue, biological tissue properties. There's many of them. That's why also it's not necessarily the case that we need to focus on that one. But at the same time, what we know is that we can measure highways. We can look at the properties of these cables. And, co and they correlate very much with human cognition, language, uh, reading, development, aging, both in, in disease and health. So this has been an opportunity started, that started about 20 years ago. The technology is picking up in these years, becoming big to the point that now many, you know, uh, many studies are coming that try to map this sort of uh, measurement in large population of individuals. So when I started working in the field, I started realizing that obviously this is all computer <laughs> generated stuff. And, and there's limits to what you do when you divide, derive a, matter, a, a model from a measurement. So what I did when I moved early at Stanford, I, I was working on my brain. I've you seen my brain in a couple of pictures now. And I identified my archaeophysics. I said, why, why can't I can't speak well English? You know, all these years in the US. I've been here 16 years now. Right? So, but I look at the archaeology, which is related to language processing. And then I also identify the, the cortical spinal tract. I used one algorithm, one model for identifying this highway, and that's what I got. I got this skinny guy on the left, right? <laughs> then I changed the algorithm. This is within the same software, so no request for software change or install. Right? <laughs> this is the same software. <laughs> and I changed just some of the parameters, right? And look what I got. On one side, it's two skinny guys not touching each other. On the other side, two bushy structures completely interconnected. So I said, what do I do after this? 
which one is a good model of language for modern context. So if you think about the fact that these highway terminate into cortex, so they connect computers, right? That's what I told you before. Now, this is the computers, the determination of the arcuate in one model, right? All the computers in these areas of the cortex, remember the pink picture before, connect to this area of the cortex, and they are related to my language capacity. And the other model was saying a very different story, because it was saying very small part of the cortex is dedicated to language. Only that little focal, focal point. And I said, OK, this is, we need to do something about this. We need to understand, at least understand, which one of these models is better. So we developed a technology called LIFE, Linear Fascicle Evaluation. It's basically a technology that gives us a way of doing model selection. Technology that allow us to study this structure, this macrostructure, and understand which one are better. So the, the technology really takes these spaghetti plates. Think about all these streamlines that I've been showing at spaghetti from Italy, and, and, and use them to generate synthetic MR signal, right, back into the measurement. Now, if the signal that a spaghetti plate generates is similar to the measurement, that's a good spaghetti plate. Otherwise, maybe you need to change something. So in doing this process of generating the signal, we actually can reject some of the streamlines, some of the brain highways, because they don't contribute anything positive to the prediction of the signal. Or we can accept the others. Most importantly, oh, I went too far. most importantly, we can do that one brain at a time. So we can customize the study of each individual brain, which is a big deal now in neuroscience. So the way the normal process goes, here I'm showing measurement of my brain. It's one slide, horizontal slice through my brain. But you see the image intensity was changing because I was measuring water diffusion in different direction. And you could have seen that as the image changes, you see structure going through the brain, right? And that's what we use. We, we take that sort of measurement. We run tractography software on the clusters. And then we get what is called whole brain connectome. These are like full set of highways that fill up the white <coughs> brain, the white man. Now, the life mechanism works the other way. It takes the highways, runs a model, and generates synthetic MR signal. So runs the model and generates synthetic MR signal. So the way it does it is very simple. So it might feel complicated. You know, There's all these streamlines, all these highways, and how do you generate MR signal? The way we do it, we take one of the, high, the streamlines at the time, we evaluate that equation that I have up there. That equation on one side has D, which is the image intensity for each theta, each direction of diffusion that I measure. And on the other side has a model of orientation, A, B, C of, side, of theta, of the fiber. So that equation uh, predicts diffusion, as I'm showing there, at each location on the streamline. So what I do, I evaluate the equation at different location on the streamlines, given the orientation of the streamlines, I predict some diffusion of water in that direction. Then I put everything together into a one single very large model that predicts diffusion of water at each location in the brain, given all the streamlines that I got from tractography. So I do I give you another intuition about it. So let's focus on one location of the brain. Just we don't measure pixels. We don't have 2D images. We measure, we measure what's called voxel, 3D images. Okay. So each one of those 3D images has multiple, in one location of the brain, has multiple measurements. So I get image intensity at the location of the arrow as function of the diffusion direction that I measure. So I measure diffusion in this direction, in this direction, in this direction. So each one of the diffusion direction, there is a measurement. Now, the image gets bright when I find weak diffusion. Water is constrained in that direction. And the image gets strong when I find, uh, gets dark when I find strong diffusion in that direction. That means there's a highway going in that direction. Now, that is our target here. What we're really saying is that on one side, we have a measurement. On the other side, we have a model. Let's call that a model. 
of the highways. And, and we want to predict the measurement with that model. So we're really talking about forward prediction. So let's say that that model gives us four different fascicles in that single location in the brain. What we're really saying is that each fascicle makes, makes a prediction of diffusion in a specific direction, and the linear combination of those fascicles is our best approximation to the signal. So we go from a single voxel to the whole brain by stacking the you know, many measurements, 90 measurements of diffusion direction for each voxel, for each location in the brain, into one very large vector. And now we build a model, a GLM, a general linear model, with all the predictions from the model of 3D anatomy. Right? So each column of this matrix is a predictor that is generated by evaluating the equation given the orientation of a single streamline F fascicle in each location. So I have many columns that say half a million columns, half a million parameters. Then what I do, I do linear regression, and I assign a weight to each one of these predictors. Okay, what is the best linear combination? One weight per fascicle. And what I do, I find uh, fascicles that have either positive weight or zero. And when I interpret these weights as a fascicle being there or not. So I, I, the only difference I do here is I, I do a non-negative constraint to the model field. So the validation step, we can eliminate highways that don't contribute successful to the signal. So this was at the point, you know, now in 2014, was, it, was the new thing. We had for the first time in the field an error, one error, you know, not necessarily the best error, but one error. We, had, we didn't have an error metric for these models. So this error says that in each location of the white matter, now colored in red, there's some error of the tractography model in predicting the signal. So we can use that error. For example, we can go back to the original question. You remember I showed you two different models, and I say, which one should I go about it if I want to study my brain? And now I'm going to compare the error voxel-wise. For each location in the brain, I'm going to pin the error from the, you know, the, the larger model in the bottom and the skinnier model in the top. So the probabilistic model is the one in the, the bushier one. The deterministic model on the y-axis is the skinny guy. And I'm comparing in the same voxel the error of the two models. So what you can see is that for a majority of the voxel, the error is above the diagonal, which means that the skinny guy has larger error than the other guy. In some voxel, you can also see the skinny guy does pretty well. Okay? But if you need to pick one, go for the one in the bottom. Right? So this is how we can use now this error to evaluate fit models to individual brain, customize the model, eliminate fascicles that don't contribute to the method. So we made software available early on as we finished the project, uh, code on GitHub, we made some demo, and you know people kind of started using it because it was, was, was a need. Now we're working more to develop this technology to further and to provide services, like literally web services, that allow people to generate these sort of computations, uh, people that might not have an interest in learning all the software around them. So that's kind of the part about my research. The next thing is neuroscience. It's coming to an era that these images are coming, these digital images of the brain can be collected. You know, We have an amazing scanner here in Bloomington. We have several up in Indianapolis. But many universities around the world have that. So you might have heard about the Human Connectome Project. This was a $30 million project that NIH funded now five years ago. The, 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 the anniversary of the five years was actually in spring. Uh, they collected uh, about 1,200 subjects. And for each subject, they measure behavior, they measure biomarkers, they, they measure their back health background, and they measure brain scans similar to the one that I just showed you. So for each one of these subjects, we can map their highways. Uh, now a recent, talk, a recent project just started, which is called the UK Biobank. This is in, in, in England. In England, they have a public health system. So they can actually talk to their customers, and 100,000 of them, and it's going to go up to 500,000 of them, agree to participate to this multi-year, this is more than five years of study, 
they will donate all their health information, obviously privately stored and everything, everything safety, security is very important in this case, but they will collect data, six different types of scans, different measurements for each one of these 100,000 subjects will be collected as part of this project. This is 600,000 scans. Now, as the project comes, there's also a problem of the fact that data are quite different. We can collect data in very different ways. Uh, data can be low resolution, high resolution, and, and that matters. It turns out it matters a lot. When you collect high resolution data, as in this case, this is a very high resolution data that was recently released as part of the human connector, you can start seeing highways that are smaller, small country roads. Right? And as you collect data at lower resolution, you don't see the country road, you just see 69. And the work uh, this is not just a few project. This is one other example. The Allen Institute in, in Seattle recently released uh, an atlas of a single brain scan at a very, very high resolution postmortem. So this is just another example to give you a sense that there's plenty of data out there to actually compute on and start harvesting this data for new discoveries in neuroscience. <laughs> Methods are also, also different. I just showed you that. I just get, got you through a journey of the fact that different methods map the brain very differently. Okay? So there's all these moving parts. There's many data, different data, many models and methods, different <coughs> methods. And this is what we're sending. Data is flowing to us in neuroscience. We can collect it. We have standards for files. We have methods of collections. Now, the next generation of neuroscience, we need to address the issue of how do we do big data processing of all these data sets? What kind of questions can we ask? How do we handle the storage? How do we handle the processing of all these data? So going back, the big picture is that in the recent years, we went from web tissue preparation like this one to digital preparation like this one. Now that we have digital preparation, we can compute. Turns out, the first problem we address with Cesar, Cesar is sitting right there next to Robert. When I moved to IU, I had this technology, but I had one problem. The problem was that each one of these models that I was building for each brain was 40 gigabytes on disk. These are measurements from different do you remember the matrix I showed you before with the columns and the streamline? That was a 40 gigabyte matrix. Okay? So I started talking to Craig, actually Brad, Brad Wheeler started me up with Craig, then Robert and Matlin. They were the first uh, to start me up how do I go on a cluster. I need cars, obviously I need a lot of memory to run my processes. But then I work with Cesar. And Cesar uh, developed a way of taking these matrix and reducing the size. So let me show you how we do that. So the matrix that I showed you before, each column is a predictor. We're trying to predict the data. We assign weights, 40 gigabyte, right? So the insight that says I have is that you can take that matrix and decompose it into two parts. OK, so let's look at this. We take the data, y, we organize it into a two-dimensional matrix, from a vector to a two-dimensional matrix. The, the weights, we keep them as they are. Now, m can be divided into parts. One part is called an indicator function. It's a function that tells me which particle was in which voxel and where it was pointing. Okay? And then D, it's a dictionary of pre-computed predictions. So instead of filling in phi at every location, depending on the particle, I pre-compute all potential predictions or diffusion, keep them there, and keep using them. So now, this is amazing what happened after all this work that we put into this paper. We went from, you know, here I'm showing gigabyte of M as function of how many streamlines I have in the model. So M went from, you know, used to grow very fastly and it go up to 30 gigabyte or more. And now as you grow the highways number, actually M stays, the model stays quite small. So the model is under one gigabyte now and it runs on the system very well. Actually, Jefferson and Scott, I don't know if they're here, they helped us recently 
using OpenMP on cars, then we can, we went for computing because now everything is parallelizable, right? Again, because these are independent functions and different dimensions. With OpenMP, we, we have a six, speed up of six X. So we went down 30, 40 X in memory storage uh, since I jo joining IU and then speed up to so CXX using one system. And we're trying to now compile it so that it works on other systems. For the moment, it only works on cars. Then we went back and said, well, is the model still accurate? So here I'm comparing the error of the old model and the previous model, you know, they lie on the diagonal, different data sets, quite accurate. And now that we can do this very lightly, we can go back and think about evaluation of models and studying the brain and doing discovery on these big data sets. So you understand the, the point there, right? Imagine if I have 100,000 brain and each brain needs 40 gigabyte. I cannot do that. So one first large scale evaluation we did over, actually this was three months of work, me and Cesar and Brand. No, I don't see him. Well, so one of my graduate students helped with that. So we used CART and BigRed2 to, to evaluate about 2,000 of these brain connections. So what we did, we took a few subjects from different data sets and we harvested all the methods we had for identifying these highways. So what I'm showing here is a single subject, and each point, it's a different tracking method that maps the brain in a different way. And I'm plotting on the y-axis the number of fascicles that I can identify right, with the method, and on the x-axis, the error of the model. Right? So you can see it's clearly organized around a diagonal. So there's some models that have higher fascicles and lower error. Right? I'm not going to describe the method, then we can go that later. So I'm going to now show different subjects, different individual brain mapped the same way with multiple methods. One subject, two subject, three subject, four. Then I'm going to change the data sets. I'm going to go to a data set that has a different spatial resolution. I told you there are different types of data. So you can see clear clusters, right? So there's actually data that is a high resolution. There's data that is a low resolution. This work would have taken months and months. We actually did most of the computing in about three or four weeks, okay, on, on cars. This is 2,000 different data sets all combined together. These allow us to identify which one is the best method for each data set for mapping the brain, right? You want a method that is low error and high number of mapped connections. We can also look at reliability of these errors. You see those error bars on each one? Some of the error bars are tiny, but each dot has an error bar. Each symbol has an error bar. So some methods are very reliable, other less so, okay? That's also informative. Now, let's take a look at two of them to see how they look in terms of anatomy, right? I haven't showed you the anatomy. So here is one measurement from one subject from the Human Connection Project. First and second repeat. What we do, we run the methods twice and see how similar, how reliable is the, the mapping. <coughs> Quite reliable. Then we change the method and see how compatible are two methods. And you can see that this is the same subject. Again, different methods matter. They're different. One guy, less connection. The one on the top, more connections. We know how to do that, right? So the, the model on the top actually is lower error, more connection. Let's study that. So there's different data sets, different spatial resolution. But there's many, many parameters, right? There's different brains, there's different spatial resolution, different diffusion direction, what the measurement look like, different SNR in the data, uh, different tractography, different scan parameters, there's many differences. So we worked hard to try to put all these together and identify some meaningful numbers, right? What a new investigator should do. If you want to study a brain and you're studying a project, you want to measure 100,000 of brains, you have the funding, what should you shape? What kind of data should you pick? Well, one unit that I like to think about is how many connections, brain connections, can I see if I use a data of a certain type, certain SNR, certain mapping method. So we derive, we derive actually a single equation that predicts the number of fascicles in the brain supported by the data as function of data SNR and model quality, PDR, we call it. That's the equation. It's a multilinear equation on one axis as data, on the other axis as 
mapping, tractography method. It's a very simple, you know, it depends on the SNR, not just on the spatial resolution. You need to get good spatial resolution, high SNR, then you can map the brain very well. Now, as a result of that equation, I thought, okay, let's try to provide these as a service. Many, many investigators all across the, the United States are studying studies almost weekly, right? And many of my colleagues actually sometimes called me and asked me, okay, I'm studying this study. Do you think I should use two millimeter resolution and 200 directions or one millimeter resolution and 60 directions? And, and actually the answer is I don't know. Meaning I can tell you some numbers that show you how much you will map on the brain, how well you will map the brain, but it's not going to always work the same way. So what you really need, you need a sort of service that allows this investigator to not just ask a question once, but keep asking the question every time for every subject. So we work with Soichi. Where is Soichi? Soichi sitting here. It's in Robert's group. For this is work that started about spring. And so far, we have a first working prototype of an online system where users can upload data that they measure in any site in the US and do this processing and generate very meaningful results. So I'm going to get out of the presentation quickly. I hope everything works out with the technology we're using for displaying. I'm going to show you how the system works. So. The system starts with a series of queries. So you log in, and you know you log in through our gateway, and then add the password, right? Okay. Good. I mean, so as you log in as a new user, you see. Something like this, where you can start a new project, say, I need to evaluate this sort of data set, and there are several services. We will validate your files. You would provide us with files. We will validate the files are what we need, and then we will run some configuration, and then we will submit the jobs through CARS or Big Red 2. We're trying now to work with JetStream and do that in direct submission to JetStream. But the system works right now. So actually, yeah, last, it takes some time to develop, to actually process the data. The full process, depending on the queue, is between six hours and 12 hours at this point. And, uh, but it works. So here, there's some output that we can look at, you know, all the files that were generated that are stored on DC2. And then these are the output of the brain segmentation. Look at here. We can see real time how the brain of this individual was segmented and how the segmentation, the identification of the major surface, this is where the computers are, look like in this brain. Then we track and we get responses you know, for all the spaghetti that we're creating on these highways. And after we identify the highways, we run the live system and we provide some output. Right. So these are the output that the system now provides. It's the weights. That I've been talking, you know, higher weight, good, good result, and the error, lower weight, good result. And now we're using top edge technology. So you can download the data, you can download the raw data, the files, the images. The idea here is that if you're not quite sure yet what to do and how to analyze the data, you can quickly come to some prototyping, you know, scan today, scan tomorrow, come here, upload the data, get a couple of results, and then you know, decide, okay, I'm gonna use this protocol for scanning, and I'm starting my next six months of work based on that. We can even so compare the data to the actual original <coughs> reference data that I just showed you in my results. So here, uh, we're reproducing the data that Cesar and I generated for the paper, the science paper I just showed you, and we're showing the new data set. So this data set turns out didn't do very well. It's actually quite low in number of connections, right? And the error is, it's okay, it's kind of in the middle of the book of the pack, right? But you know it. And you can go back and try to change things and change, move that data point around. So we're using the technology to create reference for people so that they know where they're standing in the landscape of this big project, right? So this is human connected data. This is human connected data with the scanner that we have here. This is the GE scanner that we had at Stanford. They can really look at that and compare. 
And even we can show the, the final anatomy. How do, you know, actually the other thing I show you is the anatomy. Look at this. Directly from online, we can identify and segment the tracks and show in these individuals the full tracks. And this is just interactive. People can take a look at them and say, you know, the white outline is actually the brain of this person that I just showed you before. And these are the major highway of this person. Okay? This just happens on the fly, as long as we have computing available, storage available, it happens. Now it's working. We're going to make it better and better in the future. This is just a prototype of what we're aiming to do. We're aiming to apply for grants with this so that we get resources and the funding that we really need to go full scale, right? So I'll conclude my presentation. Sorry if it took a little bit too long, maybe. Uh, brain bites, so we just went from wet tissue to digital images we can use, modeling, computing, hydro computing. And neuroscience is at the age that high performance computing and big data is coming. And I think IU is in a special position because of the expertise we have, you have, Okay, this is just a start. I think these are prototypes. I want to work in the next years developing really a core for neuroinformatics here at IU so that we can put IU on the map. Okay, turns out we were lucky. We recently got awarded the only big data neuroscience grant from NSF, right? This was in September. So we're already on the map. Next year, in September, most likely, we will have a national workshop. At IU, uh, everyone from the Midwest and beyond will come here to IU to showcase what they do with high performance computing and web services and workflows and computational neuroscience applied to brain science. And we'll have a so we have one year ahead of us to work. And I really look forward to work with you know, Soichi and Robert, Craig, and these people to really make this an asset for IU in the next year. <laughs> So one thing to think about, these are lots of hours of computing and lots of storage. That the raw data of the human connector project is about 30 terabytes. Sorry guys, there will be requests. <laughs> and the, the biobank, the biobank is about two terabytes. The biobank does not have a mirroring system. Think about that. The data are in UK. When they presented this last spring, a human brain mapping. I stood up and I said, what am I supposed to do? Go and download it? <laughs> like, <laughs> how am I going to download two petabyte of data? How do I even get access? So there could be opportunities to kind of mirror the data here so that people can get access. If we, rela if we work on creating relations between computing, right, jet stream and all the exit red network <laughs> and these data, people will come and use the data, OK? So this is the big box that we're facing. These are all the opportunities that we have. I just could put here just a few of the people that help us. So Cesar down there, Brent, who I thought it was going to come, contributed to some of the tracking. Robert Craig and Soichi. Soichi developed all the services that you've seen. Arvid was fundamental in kind of monitoring everyone. I could not find a picture of Lee Mai online. So she was really helpful in getting all the communication, you know, between you guys and me. Sometimes I just email her and she forward the email to the right person. <laughs> and that's much faster than figuring out on KB who was supposed to do <laughs> Sorry about that. Matt and Jeff and Steven actually were really helpful for getting the space I needed. Turns out I cannot use the standard model here. I understand that you guys have been working for many years with researchers that flush the data after a few weeks or months of work. This data is too important to flush, and it takes too long to flush. So it, the, the next thing we need to find is like a, a, together a way of storing the data for a persistent way. The I.O. operations are not super intense, but needs to be some I.O. operations so we can work. So I look forward to working with you guys. Please stop by our lab. We're lab meetings on Fridays, and uh, we I'm open to talking to all of you. I really want to do this here, right? We, this is an asset that not many universities have, not many universities provide, and we can do it. We can put us on the map of neuroinformatics. Thank you very much.
Any questions for our speaker? Uh, I just wondering how far you can take the analogy of network cabling. Um, particularly, we have the you know the network cables we use are shielded to prevent crosstalk, where the signal in one induces the signal in the other. I wonder if that happens in the brain. You, had, you saw where the the pathways were intertwined. Do they induce signals in each other? That actually is a research question. Okay. Right, so it's a good one. So the, the, the shielding that you talk, the mining, actually that's the original idea of this mining, that it would shield and would allow, in a certain way it does two things. It shields and it actually shortens the distance of the cable. Very interesting, right? So the mining wraps their little cells, they wrap like little uh, cylinder, a cylinder here and a cylinder here and a cylinder here. It turns out when you do that, the signal doesn't have to travel the whole length. It jumps in between cylinders. So you effectively shorten. Now, it turns out, if you change the quality of that cylinder, the precision of relaying of the signal, it's higher. So you can communicate faster because you have more precision on each communication. So there's many of these things. Now, mining changes, the cylinders are skinny people. For example, MS, multiple sclerosis, affects mining. Alzheimer affects myelin. Right? People, when they start losing their cognitive orientation, myelin and cell bodies in the area of the hippocampus are changing. So one of the projects I have funded, actually, actually I should put my funding here. Uh, one of the projects I funded is with uh, Andy Sakin up in Indianapolis to try to apply this method to study Alzheimer's disease. We're planning to, we're building uh, data now, preliminary data to apply for bigger grants. The other one is the NSF that I just told you. That grant also. We, this is the sort of question we want to ask, like your question. To do that, we have the measurement. We need to improve measurements and methods. But really, we need to provide the infrastructure so that we can ask questions. And not just me, you know, after two years of computational neuroscience can ask one question. But just people can ask the questions, you know, the other researchers. Other questions? It's not related to the earlier question. Uh, does, it, does it appear that in the white matter there are no actual junctions between the? So uh, the white matter, there's junctions between the cells of white matter. This is our current understanding. They somehow communicate. But your question is different and is important. Is the, is the neuron communicating? And the neurons don't communicate to current understanding at the level of the cables. Right? So when they cross, really mean they pass by each other. Right? But their mining around might be somehow cross-talking. So that, for example, if you ask uh, mining of a cable that is used majorly, then mining will build up with training, okay? Become better and better because we need more reliable, you know, if you're learning a sport, right? You, you want to get your motor control better and better. That will happen with computers getting better and better and faster in the chip, in the CPU, but also the cables will adjust to support that computing. So I always, I used to make this metaphor. Imagine doing what we do today, like literally what we're doing here with a modem, 40K, right? It's not gonna work, right? So if you improve the computing, if you improve the computing, you have to improve the cable. That's the only way it's going. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. are here because we, in, in the computing center, we invent things now and then, but most of the time we function as an amplifier. Now, as an amplifier, we do go to 11, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we really, you know, we, we, we're here to support and amplify the, uh, the great science that you and your many colleagues are doing. So thank you so much. And uh, let me propose this. Uh, let me propose that we take a 10 minute break. And then we will come back and have phase two of today's theme of uh, younger scientists with big careers ahead of them and big ideas.